Bill has produced an incredible amount of uh, publications on plant community related research uh, and a rare plant related uh, research over the years. Um, Bill recently in 2018 published a book entitled The Ecology of Plant Communities of South Texas, and it's an incredible read. Uh, roughly two years ago, um, Bill and um, uh, research associate uh, Donna Taylor were funded a project through the Conservation License Plate Program, and it was a research project to, to look at the ecology of these two Maple Canyons, specifically in the Southern Edwards Plateau um, and Bandera and Rio County. So without uh, further ado, um, I'll pass the torch over to uh, Dr. Van Auken. Bill, you're up. Real quick though, Jason, please pass me the host controls. How do I do that? Just right mouse click on my name in the participants list. Okay. Sign. Uh, you can go up to participants at the top and assign controls to me. Okay. So I says Jason, her research name. Do I click on that? Click on my name, Meredith Longoria, right? Now let's click on it. Participant. Okay. Okay, so yes to that. Thank you. Okay. And then uh, let me assign. Bear with me a Uh, I just passed you back the controls to show your screen. Okay, Bill, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, we'll get started uh, right away. Uh, pass the torch to Dr. Bill Van Auken. Big two, Big two Maples in Central Texas. You're up. Right. Thank you, Jason and uh, uh, Meredith. Appreciate it very much. Uh, this is new to me, and, and uh, you know my uh, high tech stuff is a uh, slide rule. And many of you probably don't even know what they are, but uh, anyway, I'll do the best I can. Uh, Jason, give me one heads up on if you can hear me okay. I can hear you okay, but if you could speak just a little bit louder. Um, all right, I'll try. How's that? That's much better. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Donna Taylor was going to be here to uh, go through some of this material with me, uh, except she's had some difficulties with, uh, you know, the virus and the families and stuff like that. So she's not here. Uh, Dr. Bush has been very, very helpful because I, I just don't know that stuff. Anyway, uh, we're going to do a little bit of stuff that uh, we've done in the past and, and some things that I'm, you know, kind of planning for the future, but there it goes. Second. Hey, can you get the slides? Okay, thank you. Okay, well, this is what I'm going to try to do. Um, you know, I'm going to look at, you know, I'll show you where the big tooth maple is found. Talk a little bit about the plant and finding populations and some growth of seedlings and some of the seedlings. Here we go. Uh, you can see the range, or at least I hope you can, uh, in in Texas, way down. This is where we are. This is where we've been studying. But most of the populations in Texas are fairly wide, widespread or uh, widely separated. Uh, they're in the uh, Edwards Plateau physiographic region. 
but uh, and then uh, you know in uh, New Mexico, a little in Colorado, but then farther west as well. So it's it's fairly common, and a lot of people call this the western sugar maple. Well, it's not very sugary, but that's still a name it has. Um, if you get into the West Texas in, in the mountains out here, Big Bend or uh, uh, Davis or the Guadalupe's, uh, at the higher elevations, you find it uh, fairly, it's, it's fairly common. But here in Central Texas, it's not so common. Uh, I always think of the uh, Acers as in the family Aceraceae, but some people have put it in the Sapindaceae and they just use the Aceraceae. Um, anyway, uh, it's an interesting species. Uh, it's, this is a, a shot of, of, of the top of one of the trees, but it's a small to medium, you know, sized deciduous hardwood, uh, relatively drought resistant. And depending on where you are, it can have different forms. Uh, you know, it's on rocky slopes, multiple stems, and, uh, you know, they don't get as big. And then in the moist canyon bottoms, they get much bigger, uh, and usually it's a single stem. The, uh, the leaves that you see over here uh, are, uh, you know, they're simple. Uh, they're fairly big, uh, and they're palmate, and they have these, these uh, relatively deep lobes, as you can see here. Uh, they're supposed to be deciduous, and uh, you know, I'm not sure of that, but these are all male flowers here on this particular uh, stem or flowering bud. And then the fruits over here, uh, they're double-winged uh, samaras. And uh, very interesting, I remember these, not from the big tooth maple, but when I was growing up, we used to cut maple trees, break them off, and then throw them and watch them flutter to the ground. So that was the uh, uh, plants in the fall are just spectacular or the leaves in the fall are just spectacular. Uh, they can be, uh, you know, orangish, but uh, many of them are just red, red, red. Very, very pretty. This is one of the larger trees in the canyon. Uh, that's me in the blue uh, jacket. I was colleagues, uh, Shen Shen Shen, who is, uh, is now in the northern part of our country with her husband, but uh, measure, you know, basal area or basal uh, circumference on these areas down here, and then use that to, uh, uh, to determine the, uh, the size and the, uh, of the plants in the communities. Uh, another story, in many cases, you can, you can find uh, so. hey, Dr. Van Aken, can you can you pause for just a second? Hey, everybody, I need everybody to please mute their microphone. So I don't want to call out who's making the sounds, but I can tell by looking in the participant window. Somebody's there's several people unmuted, and it's causing a lot of background noise. It's making it hard for people to hear Dr. Van Aken. Please. I still see the person who was making the, no the noises not muted. Yeah, either they're not there or they're not going to mute. So. Okay. Um, we'll go ahead and continue on. Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay. There we go. So, anyway, you can find uh, some of the juveniles. But it's hard to tell uh, at this stage that you see in this picture whether they're, you know, oh, well, just how old they are. But I suppose you do, but it's it's not not that easy. Well, where do, where do we find them? One of the places, uh, and it's a place where we work, is called the ABK or ABK S S N A Albert and Bessie Kronkowski State Natural Area. It's it's five or six, maybe a little more miles west of Bernie, uh, Texas. 
And if you don't know where Bernie is, it's just a little about 20 miles north of San Antonio. Uh, anyway, uh, there are a number of communities in this area that we have studied. Uh, this is the way we first studied them. Uh, Ms. Taylor had a friend who was a pilot with a plane and uh, he was kind enough to take us up and fly us over the uh, ABK Preserve. And this is one of the things that we saw, uh, again, in the canyons. And you see a lot of color here. Well, this is the fall of the year and uh, some of these are tell from the air? Uh, not really. Uh, they have various colors, but they're, they're all, all of these are dis deciduous species. Uh, and they include the maples, uh, Texas ash, uh, black cherry, uh, and uh, some, of the, some of the oaks as well. So it's an interesting community. But if you want to know for sure what is down here, uh, you have to get on the ground. Uh, and we, we, we took these, we took this picture from the plane, but we used a drone like this. Now, where those, uh, those communities were more specifically, uh, and this is the drone, you know, the, our landing pad. And, uh, if you get up in the air, this is the drone looking at us or vice versa. And where we are headed with the drone is over into this, this canyon over here. We're on a hilltop. When you get the drone up in the air, you get views like, like this. This is called Tin Cup Canyon in the ABK Preserve. And a lot of these plants uh, that show the color in the leaves are maples. Not all, but a lot of them. And, um, what we did was to go on the ground and then take, uh, you know, a series of quadrant measurements uh, while we were there, identifying the, the plants, the trees, and then the understory as well. Uh, this is the kind of thing that we we're doing. So we, we identified uh, five, what we thought were five different communities, one here, 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 and then up here. And this, this is kind of in between, but we could have measured this one as well. And then we outlined the area and then calculated how much area we had in these different communities. Uh, so we could make an estimate, and I mean estimate, of how many maples and other species we have, the density basically. Well, if you're on the ground, this is what it looks like. Uh, this is a little out of focus, but um, please bear with me. But we were headed to an area between where the camera was taking the picture and that hill in the background. And headed down, it looks a little more like this. Maples are over here in the canyon bottom with the other deciduous species. We were headed down this way and then down through the maples here. Uh, is it steep? You tell me. The trees are pretty much upright in this particular shot, but you can see that the ground is fairly steep and it's it's you know close to a 45 degree angle. So you know you'd start out standing, slipping and sliding, and then a little later you'd end up on your behind sliding the rest of the way down into the canyon. But uh, this is the way you get down there. And then when you're in the bottom, this is what it looks like. You know, a, a, a dry stream here, uh, if just after a rainfall, in many cases, you, uh, this will be running. And then uh, I think this is uh, me here and perhaps Donna or Jim uh, Jan up here. But some of the trees down here, not all, some of them are maples. I think this is a maple here, a big tooth maple. And the fluff on the ground, in some cases, is really pretty thick, mostly maples, maple, maple leaves. But it's a very, very pretty, interesting area. Well, if you run a series of quadrants on the ground, uh, 
things we can get or measure, you know, certainly the name of the species, and then the density, and this is in, in number of plants uh, per hectare, and this is a standard deviation. Then we get a relative density value fairly easily, and then we predicted from knowing the area of these communities, what the expected or actual number of our density is. Uh, the area we calculated for these communities in this canyon was about four hectares. And this, the trees are in plants per hectare. So per hectare times four gives you about 30, and that's, you know, 3,000 that we have here. And then juniper is always juniper present, and uh, thousands of those. And this one, this is Prunus serotina or black cherry. And uh, we have a few of those. But you add all these up and then the other species too. And the density in this area was about 1300. Uh, so it's an interesting area. And you know, when you do these calculations, you come up with, geez, a lot of maples down there. Well, this is dependent, of course, uh, on the communities being the same from the bottom of the canyon up, up to the upper edge. And that's not always true. We don't know how these, com these communities are structured exactly, but it seems like, uh, you know, the position in the, in the, in the canyon, uh, bottom or up on the hillside, uh, probably rainfall or depth of the soil, and then, the, uh, you know, certain other species in the neighborhood. So, you know, it, it's a complicated thing, and we're not exactly sure of everything. But, uh, you know, it's an estimate. Well, can we find other areas that have big tooth maples? Sure. You can drive around on the roads and you can see them during the fall of the year, but it's hard to figure out exactly. And of course, everything is private, almost everything is private property out here. So they've got to find the owner and get permission to get on their property. But there's another way. And if you use satellite photography, like this, and these are available, you know, online, these pictures, but you have to make sure you get pictures that are taken in the fall of the year or everything, everything looks like juniper, 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 which is what it is mostly. And then of course, these areas have been cleared and no telling how many times they've been cleared. But if you look at aerial photographs from back in the 1930s, most of this area, was grassland, as a matter of fact. Not all of it, but most of it. And that was a big surprise to me. Well, anyway, you know, so how, how, does, how do these satellite images help us? Well, if you magnify them or blow them up, uh, you can see, and this is the same area that I was just showing you. This, this is the hilltop where this road is, and, uh, you know, sparser vegetation or sparser trees. And then you get down into the canyon, and then you find you have a uh, a deciduous community down here that may have uh, some maples. And these are this is this is the drainage here, you know. So you have more deciduous trees down here as well. Well, we did a study, and we were interested in plant mortality, but these are just juvenile mortalities or seedling mortalities. And so we had, you know, six, two, two different treatments here, six treatments, six, oh, excuse me, six plants here, six down here. And the treatments were, these were caged and these were in the open or no cage. Well, the survival of those that were protected after one year was about what well, it was, 33%, two out of six. Uh, down here, the survival after a year was zero. So uh, that's that was interesting. And, you know, some, something's happening to the plants, to some of the plants. But if they're protected, that something is not happening. Well, it turns out it's, it's herbivory of something or other. But the problem that we had, it was a small population. Uh, this is the same data. And this, this was in October, and then this is after the winter is over, early spring. So with the exposure, this one, you have 66% mortality or 33% survival. Here in the open, they're all gone. So that was interesting. Now we're just gonna uh, 
put that aside for a minute and get into some other stuff. But it's a small sample, and we feel like felt like we had to do more than just that. Well, this is complicated, but I hope I can lead you through it. These different plots, one, two, excuse me, one, two, three, four, five, and then six. Five are replicates uh, from one community, a second one, a third one, fourth, fifth. And then this is the summary plot down here, okay? Well, what, what are we talking about? We're talking about counts, trees or plants or density, all right? And this is diameter down here, small ones, and then bigger ones out here. Uh, and the line is a fit, and we used a, we used a statistical program to fit the line. But I think you can see that it you know approaches isn't but approaches a normal distribution uh, now there's something else i want to show you we aged these trees and this up here is the time or the date that we think they established note here 1700 up here this is 2016. well there's three things i want to show you and i'm going to show them to you here on the summary plot. Notice the old ones. Well, there is one, I think maybe two, way down here at the 85. And if you look up at the top, they started in approximately 1700. That was before the USA was a country. That is very interesting to me. But the other thing that's interesting is down here. And if you look between zero and six, I think there are two individuals down there. So there are very few individuals entering the population, certainly not, you know, 20 or 30 or 40. So that's the second thing. Something is keeping these into the small ones, the seedlings, because there are plenty of seeds and plenty of seedlings to start, but they don't get recruited into the adult population. About these guys? Well, the question that I have here is, well, gee whiz, in the past, there must have been something go different going on because there were a huge number recruited uh, at various times to get this big bump or hump in the curve. If you look up here at the times, this is approximately 1950 up to approximately 1990 or almost 2000. So something very different was going on with this population here compared with down here. And the question, what is that? Why aren't the small individuals being recruited into this overall population? And that's the next question that I want to want to ask and deal with. So what do we do? We found 50 newly germinated seedlings of the big tooth maple in one canyon. In a second canyon, we planted 50 juveniles that were just juvenile seedlings that were just germinated. Now, how do we know that they are juveniles? And this is a juvenile. It's, it's, you know, approximately one year old here. But the juveniles still retain for a considerable time they're cotyledons. Those are the first leaves, and they're just kind of long linear leaves. They will drop them towards the end of the first year of growth. But we surveyed these, and we knew that they were less than one year old, just germinated. And we caged a bunch of them, not all of them. We caged half of them, and the other half we left in the open in both canyons. So I'm just going to show you a picture picture of some of these right here. So this is another juvenile. Uh, this is in its first year of growth. You know, it has what, two, four, five, I guess six, six leaves. Um, and it's fairly small. And then we tag them and we tag them a couple of different ways just to make sure we could, you know, get back to them if somebody ate the plastic flag or dug up the whole thing for that matter. Uh, 
uh, here's another example. So this, these are older ones. We don't know how old they are. They're still juveniles. They're not mature, but they're juveniles, but not you know, in the first year. This is one that just germinated the, this year. And here are two, and this is the way we kind of set things up. We try to have a pair, this one in the open and this one in a cage. And uh, so we had 25 pairs of the seedlings in each of the communities, okay? And I think I still have another picture or two. And it, this is another one here. And you can see the cage. Uh, we were worried about rodents getting in here. So they, these cages were all the way down to the ground and then they were topped. So the rodents couldn't get in. Uh, we worried about big mammals, deer and pigs. Well, we know the deer eat the uh, uh, the woody plants. We didn't know about the pigs for sure, but to make sure the deer didn't get in, we used these uh, uh, rebar uh, and knocked them into the ground as far as we could. We never had any trouble with these cages being disrupted. We had pigs in the area and they dig up everything, but they didn't bother the cages, which was interesting. And they didn't bother our seedlings that were in the open they weren't dug up so curious okay who survived and what was the survival time uh, this is the next thing that uh, that we that we worked on and this these are some of the results here now there are two populations i want to show you the two populations are from uh the different canyons uh and uh these, what I'm plotting is survival, but it's percent survival. So 100% when we started at zero. And now these are time in years. So this study went for four years. And, uh, you know, and we visited these sites a number of times during that four year period. Well, we've got two treatments here, the enclosures, and you can see that, you know, we had a couple deaths up here, but not very many. And curiously, the R squared here is not real high. Well, it's just a very slight slope. And I think that's the reason for it. Uh, could be, a, I mean, this is a linear function too. So it could be a different function. And uh, we've looked a little bit at that, but not too much. Uh, this is in the open. I think you can see a lot more, uh, fewer survive in the open than did in the enclosures. And R squared here is about 0.8. So it's a, it's a much better fit. Um, so these are the, the, these are the ones that we planted in, uh, in one of the canyons. And in the other canyon, this is what we got here. Uh, same type of plot, time and years, and then the percent survival. Start with 100 and here in the open, we're down to about 25, between 25 and 30 percent. In the exclosures, we still had some mortalities, but there's almost 60, 60 uh, excuse me, 70 percent that still survived in the exclosures. And it's curious that there's a difference, and this is from the native population, excuse me, these were not planted. The other plot was from what were planted. Um, what did we do with this data? Well, what I would like to, to know is how long some of these uh, uh, seedlings survive. So what we did is we took this linear plot and extended it down to zero so we could figure out what that might be. That's time of extinction. So what we looked at is expected population extincted, extinction time or the time that we would get zero survival or 100% mortality. And our prediction is from simple linear regressions, okay? And I say, well, maybe we should have done it a different way. That's true, but this is what we did. What did we find? Well, we got some interesting values. The plant, the, the, now, these are the two populations, so the planted and then the natural. And then the tr two treatments, exclosures, these are protected, and these were in the open. The same down here, okay? Enclosures and then open. And the enclosures, while they protected the plants, 
but of course they kept the animals out. When we calculate, and when we, we did the regression, we calculated this. If they were in the exclosures and if they were planted, these populations were not expected to get to extinction until 60.5 years. If you look at the open, these were expected to live until or for about 11.9, almost 12 years. Uh, so if they're in the open, they don't survive nearly as long as if they're protected from the herbivory. The same is true here, and, but in the, nat in the natural population, they didn't live nearly as long, 12.6 years to extinction in the, if they're protected or if they're in the open, 5.9, almost six years. So if they're enclosed, they will survive for twice as long as if they're left in the open and uh, the her herbivory potential is there. So this was pretty interesting to us. And we think, well, some of these, especially if they live for 60 years, have got to be recruited into the adult population. But if you go back to our previous slide, you know, you say, well, you know, that's gonna be a ways away. And, uh, you know, I don't know who is gonna make those measurements in 60 years. I don't think I'm gonna be able to do it, unfortunately. Well, what did we find out overall? Now, these are for the population. This is just some general stuff. So in central Texas, the, uh, the big tooth maples are found in deep, steep limestone canyons. Usually these are in north facing hill slopes in these canyons or just north facing hill slopes. Uh, factors that determine recruitment, well, they're not well understood, but herbivory is certainly critical. Uh, but there doesn't seem to be enough juvenile recruitment, at least so far, and in the communities we've looked at, to be able to sustain the mature population. Well, if we look at some of the her potential herbivory, we had zero her herbivory in a native population of the, the maples and native population of the deer. These are white-tailed deer. And this is approximately one deer per five hectares. That is about the highest population of deer that you find anywhere in the country. If we reduce the deer population, then more of the acers will survive, but they will go to extinction in approximately 12 years. This is ABK stuff and here, we had in the, in the open areas, one deer per 23 hectares. So this population has, or the deer population here has been reduced by four, between four and five times. If there's no herbivory or no deer, zero deer population, and this is in the protected acers, the ones that were in the cages, these are expected to last for 61 years. And we think that in that time, some of these will be able to enter the adult population. Something that's very unfortunate here in Central Texas, maybe in the whole state, is that the importance of carnivores in this ACER recruitment in, in Texas is just not ap appreciated. So what am I talking about with carnivores? These are mountain lions, uh, wolves, and also black bears. They are more efficient predators than the human population of hunters that are presently you know, harvesting the deer. Uh, so some adjustments need to be made. Uh, so these, uh, these uh, deer, these herbivores, are not eating all the maple seedlings. So there is a little more recruitment. You know, what's gonna happen in the future? Well, I don't know. Certainly Texas Park and Parks and Wildlife gets a huge amount of their money from, uh, you know, hunters and, uh, and people that are interested in harvesting deer. But certainly the Acer population is having some trouble because of that. Now, let me add just one more thing here and then we'll, we'll quit. But the thing I wanna add is this is not unusual uh, this uh, 
herbivory population having or herbivore population having an effect on the uh, the plants in the eastern United States oak forest which are the have been the dominant for many many years are starting to disappear because there is no recruitment and no recruitment because the maples excuse me the deer eat all of the oak seedlings in the eastern U.S., the change is from oaks to maple, believe it or not, and it's because the deer don't like the, to eat the maples, but they love the oaks, so they don't eat the maples, and the maples are recruiting. In Texas, they may not like the maples, but they eat them because they'd rather eat the maples and the oaks rather than chew on the juniper because the juniper is the last thing that they want to be be uh, be eating. So the maple population is reduced. Okay. That's where I want to quit. But a lot of people help with this, this project at different times. Uh, Dr. Taylor, James Rice, Tom Reardon, and, and the others here, you can see. Uh, and I will go to the end, you know, we all got our shares, share of bumps, bruises, and scratches. I'll also tell you something about uh, what we think in terms of the, uh, the recruitment of the maples. You know, prediction is difficult, especially if you concern the future, right? That's a quote, that's not mine originally. It's a quote from uh, Niels Bohr, who was a physicist. But it's also true when you try to deal with, uh, especially true when you try to deal with uh, uh, populations of uh, native species or well, both plants and animals. So anyway, prediction, it is a prediction and predictions are difficult, especially if you're concerning the future. So keep that in mind if you would. Okay, Jason, everybody, thank you very much. You have some questions. I think that Jason will read them and then I will try to respond to them. Thanks again. Uh, I hope uh, you enjoyed this. I hope you learned something and I, I hope it went well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Van Aken. Um, I've got the host control, so um, I don't think Jason can see the question. So I'll go ahead and read them. As they come in, um, we have one question currently. Uh, part of the issue with the eastern oak forest is a lack of fire. Oaks are very tolerant of fire, which maples are not. Any thoughts on the role of other disturbances like fire or drought in the long-term patterns of maple recruitment in Texas? Well, fire, can you hear me all right? Jason, can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you. You sound okay. good. Fire is, is certainly important. And, uh, you know, fire is important in the East, but it's not the fire, or I mean, it's a lack of fire. And the lack of fire means there ought to be more uh, oak in the population. But the oak are being eaten, and this is pretty well documented, and the maple are taking the place. So that's that's unfortunate. Uh, in Texas, you know, except for the big, well, there have been a few big fires, but none in the juniper woodlands here in central Texas. And the fires were certainly important in controlling the juniper in the past. And the juniper have just increased until they occupy almost all of the grasslands. Uh, but in some of the canyons, uh, the juniper weren't as common in the past, and they're still not real common. They're on the hillsides, but not in the canyon bottoms uh, where we find most of these maple populations. Does that help? Thank you. Um, the next question I see is, do you think feral hogs pose any problems for the system? Say again, please. 
The question is, do you think feral hogs pose any problems for this system? I think, if anything, the, seral, the, the feral hogs may be promoting some of these rare woody species because they root around so much, they dig up the soil and make it possible, I think, for the seeds of some of these species to get established. Now, do they dig up and eat the seedlings? Not that I know of, but that could certainly stand a little more study. Okay, thank you. Another question is, um, it's a statement first. I'm located at Lost Maple State Natural Area and we have quite a few of the caged maples. How long should we keep them caged? Age, height? I don't know about the age for sure, but I think it has to be in excess of 10 years. And I would say until they get to be, you know, two meters or more in height, uh, so that the, the deer are not eating uh, all of the leaves and, uh, and small branches. Uh, they may still rub on them and they may still cause some difficulty but not as much as eating all of the, uh, the leaves and uh, small stems. So yeah, keep them caged for, I think, as long as you can. Probably, and age-wise, that's difficult, but I, I think it's more than 10 years, and I think it's between 10 and 20 years. Because they grow, unless they're really fertilized well, they grow slow. Okay, Bill, can you hear me? It's Jason. Yes. Okay. So next question is, can the juniper be having a negative impact on the soil conditions that are required for the maples? On which condition? Sorry. Can, uh, can juniper be having a negative impact on the soil conditions that are required for the maple? They, they could, but I don't think they do some of the seedlings that we planted were planted in a juniper community and we never had a problem with mortality or it didn't seem like we had a problem with mortality there um, so I, I the juniper can certainly change the soil but i don't think it's had a major problem uh, or a major, uh, I don't think it's been a major factor in the, in the cause of the lack of recruitment of the, uh, of the, uh, the maples. The recruitment of the maples is, is a difficult question. And, you know, I just showed you some stuff about the, uh, the herbivory of the, the deer in the area. That's one factor. You know, what if, I mean, what if it's uh, moisture conditions? What if it's rain, uh, drought conditions? What if it requires a complete loss of the deer for some time? <laughs> and, you know, that could have happened in the past, but nobody knows for sure. And, you know, when I tell you about prediction, you know, you can try to predict past or present, or I mean, past or future you still have trouble with that because not enough information or maybe no information is available about deer populations. We know that the deer went to very low levels, uh, you know, back in the, well, I guess, mid, mid 1900s. But was that the cause of the changes that allowed for so many seedlings to get established? in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s. You know, I just don't know. I talked to the fire chief in Bernie, Texas about some of these things. And he says, well, this happened, that happened. Well, when did it happen? You know, uh, no documentation. That's really unfortunate. But, uh, you know, I am, I am very adamant on people, students, and others doing research and not publishing it. Because when you get to the future and you try to figure out what happened in the past, you can't. So it's a difficult situation. 
Okay, that's about it for that. Okay, Bill, got one more question here. Uh, uh, since here, are white-tailed deer counts or estimates were part of the data presented. Are access deer or other exotics an issue at this location? And if so, how might that be impacting recruitment? Well, they they can certainly have a a an effect, but uh, the the non-native ungulates were not present at a very high density. So I think, I, I don't think that they were a cause of the problem. Uh, I mean, they could have they could have made it worse, I suppose, but I don't think there were enough of them to do that. Those estimates that I had well, are in fact estimates, but they are of the, the uh, native white-tailed deer. Okay, uh, a couple more questions here, Bill. Uh, first one here says, do you see the changes in climate within the hill country and microclimate where maples are found to have impacts to survival and recruitment of the species? Well, I think you could say, oh, climate change is causing all of this stuff, but prove it. I don't think you can prove it. Do I think it's having a change? I, I think that climate change will have some effects, but you can't tell that from year to year because there is so much variation uh, in our local conditions as you go from one year to the next. And if you've lived in Texas for any length of time, I think you know that. Uh, it can be wet one year, dry the next year, wet the next year, but usually, uh, the conditions remain for more than just a year. And, uh, you know, seeing, seeing microclimate changes and knowing that they are an effective factor is just hard to, to, to demonstrate. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that climate is going to have an effect on all of these guys, but uh, right now I, I can't see it. Okay. Uh, a couple more questions here. Um, next question, why well, is this a good one? Um, how much can be cover or lack thereof do these maples require for optimal habitat? Well, that's that's a good question. Uh, we know, <laughs> yeah, tough one too. <laughs> it is tough. <laughs> we know that the the uh, the maples can survive in the shade for a long time. Uh, the juniper can too, for that matter. I mean, we know that you know a juniper seedling can last for maybe 35 years in the shade, but they will never take the canopy unless there's an opening. Uh, with the maples, they can take the canopy even after growing in the shade for years and years and years. Uh, they have a relatively low photosynthetic rate, uh, but, uh, you know, they continue to go on and on for many years if they don't get eaten. And uh, so what's the, what's the optimum? Well, I don't know. I would say, you know, maybe, I mean, they do fine under a full canopy. I suspect it depends on, you know, who the canopy trees are and how much light gets through that canopy. Uh, if, if they're getting, you know, 25 to 45% of the sunlight, I think they can do fine and they'll persist as long as they don't get eaten. Okay. A couple more uh, quick questions here. Um, this is another good one. Um, how much larger geographically has the population of Big Ten Naples been in Texas? Maybe I'll ask a little caveat too. I don't know if we have polar records on this or not, but anyway. <laughs> what do you think about the, 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 the historic geographic extent? Was it much larger historically? That's, that's unknown and unfortunately it's unknown. Uh, you know, with, with that, uh, that one figure that I showed you, I mean, the population in the past, or the recruitment in the past, had to be much higher. So I suspect the overall population was lower. Uh, okay. 
but you know that's uh that's another one of those things nobody's kept track of that uh and you know i mean the the uh european immigrants have been here or european i should say all of the immigrants have been here uh, for you know for a couple hundred years but nobody writes anything down and it's not saved which is just so unfortunate I, I better stop on that <laughs> or stop answering that one. Do you have another question or two? Yeah, I think this might be the last question. Um, I know we're close to 1 o'clock here. So um, why do you think the planted seedlings did so much better than the native seedlings? Oh, interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I think, and this was all way after the fact. We got those seedlings from a guy here in Bernie who sells maples, but he grows and, and he has a very high number of germination, seed germinations, but he also fertilizes them a little bit. And personally, I think those guys got a little fertilizer and because the soils, I mean, yeah, the soils are so shallow and there are tree roots everywhere that uh, the native the native ones didn't get as much res as many or as much resource as the ones that we planted. So I really think it was the uh, the fertilizer that was in the pots that we stuck in the ground. I mean the, these were not big pots. They're probably about oh, uh, five or seven centimeters by five or seven centimeters, about the same depth. But they had a little fertilizer in them and they got a little bit of a head start. So I think that's what it was. I see okay. One more question well, that just came in privately somehow. <laughs> okay, this go ahead, Mervyn. You can see this one. Um, this question is Is there a selection gradient promoting one sex in mature trees? Are there more males or females? Repeat, please. Is there a selection gradient promoting one sex? Um, the second part of the question is, in mature trees, are there more males or females? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. Uh, I don't. I don't think anybody does, unfortunately. And I, you know, I have wondered, and again, this is just a wonder, if some of these trees aren't both male and female that has have some male flowers and some female flowers but I, you know i just haven't looked that closely unfortunately so i can't tell you um you have to have some you know some somebody that has uh, either the male or female function or both of them or you're not going to have a population at all uh, so unfortunately I, can, I just can't tell you on that thank you Okay. Well, I, well, thanks, Dr. Bill Van Aken. Uh, Dr. Van Aken, we really appreciate um, you stepping forward during this kind of crazy health crisis situation we're in and presenting this and being part of a webinar series and summarizing your research um, that was, you know, uh, funded through Conservation Life Program here at Parks and Wildlife. And I also want to thank um, all the 50, looks like 50 plus participants today that joined us. So, um, Dr. Van Aken, thank you so much uh, for, um, Stepping up to the plate, and I also thank Chance Bush there for hosting you uh, to give this presentation. Oh, thank you too. Thanks for the invitation. Okay. okay. And lastly, too, um, this is being video recorded, so this will eventually be posted um, online. Uh, Barrett, do you want to talk about that real quick? Yeah. Um, so we're not quite there yet. As you can see on the slide that's that's being shared at this moment. Um, there's a place on our wildlife diversity webpage, the Parks and Wildlife Wildlife Diversity webpage URL is provided there too for you. Um, but if you go there, we'll, we have a calendar right below that red circle there that shows kind of the upcoming topics. <clears throat> you can sign up for our webinar series to receive the notifications that we send out each month so that you can register for particular topics that you're interested in. So I encourage you, if you haven't already signed up, for our announcements or our notifications, please go to that website and click on there. Um, eventually, where those topics are listed, they'll become hyperlinks. And once they're hyperlinks, you'll be able to view the archive 
webinars as YouTube videos. Um, but we're still working on that part right now. Good. I'm glad you are. Thank you. Yeah, and then look. And one other thing too, Bill, I'm going to be sending out the publication that you passed on. So I'll be passing that uh, uh, published research work that's related to this um, out to all the participants, uh, hopefully here before the end of today. So. Fine. Sure. Go ahead. It's, okay. it's public information. Okay. Thank well, you, thanks everybody. everybody for joining us. And uh, everybody has a great week. Thanks a lot.